Welcome to the Saturday Morning Nerd Show. I'm Marcus Blake, your host, and joined with me, uh, my two cohorts, Mr. Brendan Smith. Good morning, nerds. And Mr. Chad Womack of the Electric Jellyfish Podcast. Morning, folks. So we are live, and things are running a little behind, a little slow today. Uh, so thank you, Skynet, but we're going to rock and roll anyway. Uh, we got a lot to talk about, and uh, we're kind of this uh, podcast this morning is kind of our pregame show for the Oscars. Mostly, we just want to complain about shit uh, and talk about Oscar controversies and when they get it wrong. Uh, before I'm sure there will be some controversy next week about something that, in the grand scheme of things, really doesn't matter. But anyway, before we get to it, uh, a few things we got to talk about. Uh, we actually have a couple of this week's Sign of the Apocalypse. Um, just dumb things that have happened in society that you know we want to complain about. Um, but before that, I uh, want everybody to, re uh, to remind themselves, if you are a nerd, in one week, you get to see the new Mortal Kombat movie. And we are very excited about that. So um, I also love the fact that I just got a notification that uh, they've got incredible deals on the expansion packs of Mortal Kombat 11, I guess, in, in in anticipation uh, for, you know, the new movie coming out. So uh, I might uh, have to finally get everything because Rambo against Robocop, that's the ultimate match. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, and uh, check out our website, that nerdshow.com for some incredible uh, nerd news that has happened this week, especially casting news with Indiana Jones 5. Um, I just want to go ahead and say in regards to that, I don't really care about Indiana Jones 5. Obviously, we'll watch it because it's an Indiana Jones movie. Um, but uh, you really, for me personally, you made me a lot more happy about the movie when you said Matt Nicholson was going to be in it. So, there you go. I'm, I'm curious to see what they're going to do with it because, I mean, I, I love Harrison. He's my boy, but he won't be 79 when they film that movie. Yeah. I, like. I mean, we're not we're not questioning your action skills, but at some point, you know, you got to let the stunt double do most I mean, of the work. Eventually, even Tom Brady's going to retire. You know, right. I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, you know, he's speaking about people being pissed off at Kathleen Kennedy. Harrison's got to be right, because the only reason why he came back to Star Wars was to do Indiana Jones five. And yeah. Force Awakens came out, what, five, six years ago now? Uh, six. Yeah. I mean, we're a little over five years ago now. It's been that long. Uh, so and they're just getting around to doing Indy five. He's like, I was 73 when we made this agreement. What? <laughs> you know, yeah, Connery was still alive. Yeah. I mean, I think they're about to revoke your pilot's license at this point. So it's like, come on, let's let's get into making this movie. Well, he's already I'm, survived one crash, so yeah. Yeah, I thought. I'm sure. I'm sure it's going to be fine. I mean, it's not like the last Indiana Jones movie was the most horrible movie ever made. It just clearly wasn't as good as the other Indiana Jones. Although, movie. Yeah. It was just the worst. I did see one. I did see one great comment about it when they were talking about Indy Five. Was poor Harrison? He should have just stayed in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my favorite part about Indiana Jones Four is the fact that George Lucas literally went around and polled astrophysicists if surviving in the refrigerator was possible. And they gave him a 50-50 probability on it. <laughs> there were too many odds. That. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's lead lined, if, so that would protect him from the radiation. The question is, he how close is <laughs> right. he to the blast, and how much force is it gonna? Right. <laughs> it's, it's not like, the nuclear shit we're worried about. It's how hard he hit the ground. Yeah, the thing fell out of the freaking like, sky. Ron White's got a bit about somebody who's strapping themselves to a tree during a hurricane to prove how tough they were. He's like, dude, Mother Nature doesn't care how many push-ups you can do if she hits you with a Volvo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's it, it, uh, that the wind is blowing. It's what the wind is blowing. Mm -hmm. right. Well, anyway, 
Uh, but, you know, we're excited to see uh, what's going to happen with it. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're going to check it out. And, you know, one of the worst parts about Indiana Jones 4 is obviously not going to be back, Shia LaBeouf. So, you know, there you go. You're I, you already know, looking I, at it. I really would like to see them do it where Indy, you know, so they've got this. Um, do you guys remember the episode of Star Trek DS9 where Tony Todd played an older Jake Law, uh, Jake Sisko? And yeah. then he was sitting down talking to the new writer and telling his story about his dad and whatnot. Okay. Imagine that because they've got this <clears throat> new girl who's been cast. I forget her name. My, pol- my apologies to the actress. Um, uh, Phoebe, uh, Phoebe Bridges. Phoebe Waller Bridge. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you. Um, so what if, you know, she's like his new student and or yeah. she's taking over the department, the archaeology department from him as he retires as a professor and he's recounting one more tale that hasn't been told and they have a, you know, Chris Pratt or somebody like that playing a younger version of him and he's narrating the story to her. Yeah, that would be I think that would be a cool send off and a way to pass the torch if they wanted to move it forward. I don't think they're going to do that, but I think it would be a great way to do it. Well, I'd be I, if they deep faked him on somebody yeah, else. I will, I will. I will say this, though. Um, if for anybody that ever watched the uh, Indiana, the young Indiana Jones Chronicles, they did something very similar with uh, what's commonly referred to as the jazz murder mystery episode and it Mm -hmm. was a two-hour episode where they actually brought harrison ford in to do the intro yeah Um, saxophone which was yeah and you got to see harrison ford in full beard which was kind of funny because they literally just filmed that episode um right after he had just gotten done working on uh the fugitive fugitive yeah yeah, or right before but that's why he had the beard but he set it up as a great little intro finds the little saxophone in the cabin tells this tale it was perfect so yeah, yeah i i totally get that and i could honestly see chris pratt being a you know henry jones the third um since this is going to be set in the 60s and i think you kind of you know you, you get the older in son and my only thing is i really wish they would have that because it would be nice to have that kind of father son generational thing as we had in the uh, last crusade, which is still my favorite Indiana Jones. So I'm not they, saying oh, yeah. there isn't the better movie. I'm just saying that it's you know, the most fun of the three. Yeah. Right. And I will always be more nostalgic for that because that, that was the, you know, I went and saw that movie with my dad and my grandfather who we were all laughing. And that was also the time that my dad realized I was getting older when I got the joke about, you know, how, how did you know she was a Nazi? And, you know, Sean Connery lives over. She talks in her sleep. Dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's like, all right. He understands sex now. <laughs> so anyway, um, I want to mention one other quick thing. Uh, we're very excited about this particular movie coming out. It is called The Twelve Mighty Mites. And if you don't know this story, this is a Texas football story. Uh, it's about uh, an orphanage in the state of Texas during the 1930s that won the Texas State Championship in football. Uh, they were outcasts and uh, a coach or, who left a, world, a, a prominent position he came to this school to teach um, orphans and because he was an orphan himself and built up a really good football program and also brought in a lot of modern, uh, what is now considered modern football techniques because they were scrawny and they couldn't compete with big players. Um, this movie is uh, being directed by Ty Hendren who, uh, and was written by him and uh, Lane Garrison who we have interviewed on this show a few times, um, who had a really great movie years ago at the Dallas Film Festival called The Iron Orchard, which was about the heyday of the oil industry in Texas. And um, But this, I mean, it, it feels like a Disney movie, like a really kind of in that vein. Uh, but they finally dropped the trailer to this movie uh, yesterday. The point, the, the reason you haven't really heard anything about it is it got filmed like right in the middle or right at the beginning of the pandemic. They didn't know what to do with it, finishing up post. 
It's got Luke Wilson, who plays the coach. It's also the first time you have Martin Sheen and Robert Duvall sharing the screen together since Apocalypse Now. Wow. So, yeah, you got a lot of great actors, uh, you know, coming to do this movie. But I encourage people, this is one of those great sports movies that even though we're nerds, we do every once in a while talk about sports movies. But I wanted to mention, if you haven't seen the trailer, Go check it out. I, when when I watched it again, it only had like seventy thousand views, and I, to me, that's like you. Not enough people know about this movie. It looks uh, it looks amazing, and having interviewed the director and the, you know the writers, I can tell you they have made. I already know they've made an incredible movie, and it was shot all around Fort Worth. So I mean, for, for us being based in Texas, it's you know a local Texas movie, and. Um, stuff like that so it will actually be out uh, in limited screenings and, and stuff in June but um, it just like I said looks absolutely amazing so I wanted to give a shout out to that real quick all right we have actually two things about this week's sign of the apocalypse I'm going to mention one quick little complaint and then I'm going to let Brendan tell his funny story um so my little deal is it may not really be this week's of the apocalypse. It's just a complaint about how stupid people are. And so I want to preface this in some of the issues we've dealt with our magazine in trying to get it out through, you know, distribution and retail chains and all that uh, and make it available. Uh, our latest issue seriously got delayed, uh, which it is out now. Uh, you can get a free digital download off our website and we, Finally, do have printed some printed copies done and heading our way, and you know we'll be in some stores. Uh, but we've had to kind of republish it online through different channels because of well, what people are complaining about related to copyright issues. So let me I explain for those that don't know how press outlets work, or you, you, it kind of goes with the same idea of ever had to write a research paper and when you credit the sources or quotes or pictures you know there's a reason you do that you're crediting them as you didn't originally do this so you're not plagiarizing you're crediting the original sources um we've gotten a little flack for reprinting news which you are allowed to do as long as you credit the sources and link back to where the original source is and using photos and stuff like that from disney well when you're a press outlet they give you this stuff as, you know, part of your press materials that you can use for your publication. And normally, you know, you have to create an account uh, that's, there's places where you can go where you create an account, they give you access to this stuff because it's not just stuff they give to the public, which we all have. And I literally got told this week by Ingram book distributors uh, or the Ingram book company, which is the largest book distributors in the world that even though we've credited sources, even though we have logins uh, and access to these kind of sites to get press materials, do we really have the right to use this even after we've credited all the sources saying that they're not original sources through us? I literally asked, had someone ask me that and by their logic, that literally means that every nonfiction book that has ever been published doesn't really have the right to use that the material they've credited. And there's no reason to write research papers anymore in credit sources because you are still plagiarizing. And I was flabbergasted by this logic as they were like, well, you just, we, we, we really can't verify that. You really can't. Like, We've shown you our access. We've shown you where we've gotten everything. And again, we've credited our sources like we've always been taught when we first started writing research papers. Here, let me link you these five articles from comicbook.com that all credit some other website or IGN or any other geek outlet that, yes. that reports something from another geek outlet. Or when, hey, are you telling me that Fox News, CNN, and MSNBC are no longer allowed to republish something from the Associated Press or Reuters? Yeah, right. 
here, so, here's what I, this uh, this is where we tell them to do what our boot camp instructors used to tell them to, to tell us to do: put your head between your legs, jump up, and yell "pop." That's the sound of your head coming out of your ass. <laughs> Good but, God Almighty! Right, but I I really love their logic more so for every school kid that's going to have to write a research paper now, because what's the point if According to Ingram, you it's really all don't have the right to do this, despite you crediting the sources. Like, well, then what's the point? We shouldn't do anything anymore. Credit and let's not even talk. It. And let's not even talk about the rap genre of music. They're screwed. Yeah. So <laughs> no sampling. You're done. Yeah. Right. I, I anyway, needless to say, um, we're not going to stop distributing our magazine or reprinting news. We've even been given permission uh, from the editors and all the places that we credit. Um, you know, there's a reason that companies also send out press releases so you can repurpose those press releases and get news out. You know, like when we give you information about free games from Xbox and PlayStation, we're doing it straight from their press blog, announcing this stuff and using their photos and Disney Disney doesn't want us to use their promotional material to promote their product. Wait, yeah, what? right. Because <laughs> that's that's exactly and that's the other thing. You're like, you don't really have the right to use the material we're giving you to promote our product. Like, oh, okay. Huh? So you want us to stay silent and keep so, what you're doing a secret? So I'm yeah. confused. Do you <laughs> want me to promote your material or you don't? Wait, I, I'm huh? Let's follow so the, the next, logic trail. Nope, there right. is no logic There's trail. The logic birds had all the bird, the breadcrumbs. So the next time I do a press screening and get to see a Disney movie early, I'm just going to tell them, well, we really can't do the review and use your <laughs> press material. So thank you for thank you for giving us a free movie. You know, and you so can, can you can about. you can blame this book publisher for it. Right, um, right, by their logic. So, but the the, the moral of the story is. Despite what idiots like this say, if you are starting a blog, podcast, and you're doing any kind of news, and you know that's the great thing about the internet. There's so many things that have popped up, and there are so many more little smaller media outlets that have, you know, popped up and all that. And we've been around for almost ten years now. Okay, we've gotten bigger and better, and we're growing, and we're going to continue to grow. But this is how the news world works. Okay. People repost news from other places and credit the sources and use those photos, which we've been doing this since the beginning of, well, you know, the newspaper. Um, and we're going to continue to do it despite what you want us to do. If you just don't want to distribute the book because you're afraid of getting sued, that's on you. But anyway, so anyway. Uh, that's that goes in this week's uh, sign of the apocalypse and the dumbest shit that I've ever heard. So uh, anyway, as, as Jim Jeffries, you know, once said about Trump supporters, which I think this, you know, is a good comparison. If you believe that you're as dumb as shit. So <laughs> anyway, no one complaining. Now for the <laughs> for the other this week's dumbest thing you've ever done and this was on the apocalypse which by the way <laughs> which by the way is a story that i heard hat tip to the rush martin show uh 97 won the eagle in dallas which they got from the associated press <laughs> thank it's you a, for a the so anyway <laughs> see how it's done folks <laughs> so easy uh <laughs> in france I don't know. I mean, I guess France has taken over as new Florida man because I could have sworn this would have been a Florida man story, but no, nope, it's France. So, in France, there were two guys who got drunk and watched a YouTube video. Now, this YouTube video was definitely designed as either a joke or to get two drunk idiots to try it, and they succeeded. And they succeeded in both. These two morons injected each other's junk with hemorrhoid cream in order to make their junk bigger. <laughs> now, first of all, on the face of that, no, 
<laughs> and second of all, what does hemorrhoid cream do? It makes your hemorrhoid smaller. Yes. <laughs> so why would it make your junk bigger? Maybe because you're in a throbbing amount of pain, which is exactly what happened to them to the point where they had to go to the emergency room and the doctors who reported this, which by the way, this story could only happen in France because HIPAA laws wouldn't allow this in the United States. Yeah, no but shit. The, the doctors who tell this story was like, we've got nothing for you. Like, here's some anti-inflammatories and some pain meds. And oh, yeah, you're probably going to have lasting nerve damage. Now, unfortunately, we don't get an epilogue to this story because the two guys were too embarrassed to ever come back for a follow up appointment. And all I can just imagine is two guys cursing in France in front of a urinal trying to pee and they can't because they're all stuffed up with hemorrhoid cream. Uh, but, but I mean, how dumb can you be? What's, like, what's the byline uh, on this story? Sacre blue balls. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Now, because we are a nerd show, we do like to give science news uh, in our magazine, which we will still be reproducing. And by the way, we do credit those sources. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, is that theme forming here, folks, for the show? Right, right. <laughs> we feel like we have to tell you that we do this to make sure that you understand that we have the right to. But for you science people out there, this is Darwinism <laughs> at its best. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. And I feel like this is the universe, and you know, working itself out because do we really want these two people? You know, we certainly, we certainly, yeah, we certainly don't want them procreating. I mean, no. come on, folks, unless you have gonorrhea, there is no reason for a needle to ever go near your dick, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and by the way, if you're it, you know, if, if you're into some weird kinky shit, that's awesome. But like, but one, but here's the thing. It's what Mrs. Patrick Campbell said one time. There's nothing wrong inside the bedroom. As long as you don't take it out in the street and frighten the horses. And I think this is a good case of what you frightening the horses. So if, if you're going to do something, you should take like a five second rule and ask yourself, should we really? Is this really a good idea? And then there's also a reason why they have warning labels. <laughs> Gonna have to update that shit. Do not right. inject this into your penis. Right. <laughs> I, like, I, they, <laughs> never mind. I don't even want to ask. But, but you know what? We're missing the most important lesson here. <laughs> Are, Are we? we? <laughs> no, 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 no. And I say this lovingly, as we are ha as we are live streaming a video on the internet. Should you really believe every video you watch? <laughs> Because I don't want these guys even making a cup of cappuccino, much less a fucking child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You know what? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Who knows you know, what they'll use for the cream? <laughs> yeah, 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 right? <laughs> I was thinking about this last week after we were talking about during the coffee with bacon i yeah. think this is a good lesson if you're thinking about doing something take a minute stir your coffee with bacon and really think about it oh. it's a terrible idea maybe the 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 aroma of bacon and coffee will bring oh. you back to reality fire those synapses and get you going again snap your oh. head out of your ass without having to push <laughs> And then, and then if you do hurt yourself, you'll actually have the cream for the right purpose. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, we should probably also, move on. Yeah, we we could we could, we have a million penis jokes, but for the ladies out there that are always, that are always complaining that men are stupid, <laughs> we got nothing. We, yeah, we got nothing. We can do this you, all day. You win. <laughs> Uh, oh, anyway, so there you go. Don't trust every video you see on the internet, please. <laughs> be... Or, or please do it. It gives us material. 
Don't believe the hype. Uh, but if I do, make sure we hear about it. <laughs> France man, <laughs> meet Florida man. Y'all play nice. Mm-hmm. <sighs> wow. Wow. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. So the topic of the day, uh, talking about Oscar controversies of the past, uh, when they get it wrong, people who shouldn't have won and that kind of thing. Um, going in, going along with our theme of dumb shit that people do. <laughs> mm-hmm. So now we'll move on to the Oscars. Um, I feel like there is like every so few years that there's some big controversy, like a film will win best picture that you're like, huh? You know, it turns out to be like a, a real head scratcher or somebody will win an Oscar uh, that you're just kind of like, really? Uh, like, for example, uh, I'll, I'll start with Martin Scorsese. They finally gave him an Oscar for Best Director um, for The Departed. Not even one of his best movies, okay? Not even an original movie. <laughs> Just an American version of something. And, you know, and of course, Brendan, I, you know, we know why you complain. Let's, lo- let's use Italian actors as Irish yeah, I bet my favorite was how it won best original screenplay. It's like a word for word ripoff of in- Infernal Affairs from Hong Kong. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I know. franchise at <laughs> that. Yeah, there's like three of those, or three or four. Yeah, I, I, I know. That's, I mean, anyway. <sighs> but, but like I said, there are. I, I use him as an example of the, the, the Oscars finally got around to giving him an Oscar and recognizing his achievements. Or a film that's nowhere near the top of what he has done in the past. I mean, if you were going to give, and this goes into a, you know another controversy that happened in you know with the 1981 Oscars uh, for films that came out in 1980. If you were going to give him a nod for best director or you know a film that should have won best picture, how about Raging Bull? Yes. Yeah. And yet that year it was Ordinary People, you know, directed by Robert Redford. And he won both of those awards. And nothing against Robert Redford. I mean, I think he's an incredible director and has done some really great movies. But it was kind of like, really? Yeah. Ordinary family problems versus this great iconic sports film and just absolute one of the, the, the best films ever made about, you know, the ups and downs of, you know, a great boxer and everything and has. I, I can't remember one goddamn line from Ordinary People, but everybody <laughs> it was lines from Raging Bull. So, anyway. You didn't knock it down, Jake. <laughs> yeah. But that's kind of the things that, uh, you know, we're talking about is the Oscars just kind of get around like, all right, fine, we'll give this guy an Oscar. He finally deserves it. Um, I'll give you another one. Uh, Juliana Moore who finally won an Oscar for a film called Still Alice. If you don't know what that film is, we're not surprised because I think only maybe 20 people actually saw it. And it was recognized as a, you know, a great film because it's a woman, you know, writer and dealing with dementia or whatever. Not to take away from it, but it's, but again, it's not a memorable film. Just Oscar bait. Yeah, that's all it is. In while she is deserving of an uh, of an Oscar, that film yeah, compared that to other roles that she has done, like uh, Boogie Nights. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I forgot. I think it was Nicole Kidman who won the Oscar that year for something that I don't remember. <laughs> I gotta out. I gotta ask out. Wasn't that horrible that. Australia movie with uh, the country singer? Was it? <laughs> I don't know. I was, I was, I was, she did some horrible movie. I, I forget what it is called, but anyway, or was then, it the hours or is it when she played Virginia Wolf? I, I can't remember what the hell it was. Anyway, Nicole Kidman's had some stinkers, and she's been, you know, oh look how wonderful she is. <clears throat> so anyway, that's uh, you know, that's kind of what we're uh, talking about. Uh, so, Chad, I'm going to start with you on this show. What what do you think is one of the biggest Oscar controversies that somebody won that obviously didn't deserve to win? Anything and everything to do with Shakespeare and love in 98. 
I, I wasn't going to start the conversation off with that one, but yeah, that's my most famous one. Yeah, give, uh, me, give me a large break with extra bitch, please, because that was some <laughs> bullshit. Right, right. When you go up against Saving Private Ryan, and and for the, I know that the that the mythology behind this whole thing is that basically Weinstein, being the upstanding guy that he is. Uh, <laughs> went around basically starting a whisper campaign to basically sabotage Spielberg and Saving Private Ryan and getting people that were taking like exit polls to uh, basically they engineered that thing to win. It, it wasn't, yeah. that it, was, it, it wasn't, that, it wasn't that it was a good film because it was a snore fest. It made me reach for Ambien or Cyanide, whichever one I got closest to me <laughs> quickest. Um, what are you drinking? It, Hemlock. I, yeah, it was yeah, it was Drek. I'm sorry, it was Drek. <coughs> Altro didn't deserve the the Oscar she got, and that picture didn't deserve anything it got. Private Ryan no. should have pronounced that thing. No, and you're right. I mean that the Oscar campaigns that they do in nowadays that pretty much set the standard. And all it is is like, I mean, it, it's pretty much politics 101. Yeah. Let's, I was gonna say it's pretty much a road. It was pretty much the roadmap set up for our current political elections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I thought the whole point of award shows was to judge films based on their merit, you know, what they, they really bring, you know, to, to an audience. And, you know, you, I remember being in college in that year. Uh, uh, I had two English classes and it was in projects surrounding that movie. Like, you know, I had one that we did a comparison between Saving Private Fa uh, Ryan and uh, A Thin Red Line. You know, yeah, because that was the other movie. one that came out. Right. Both incredible films. Uh, very I think different films. Part, yeah, very different. Either one of those films is better than Shakespeare in Love. Absolutely. Okay. So all this, all Harvey Weinstein did was you basically lied and bribed people to get an Oscar to make your company look more important than it really was instead of judging film. And I'm not saying that Spielberg should win the Oscar every time he makes a film, but for God's sake, the man knows how to make great films. And we can't help it that if every one of the films he does pretty much deserves an Oscar. Okay. You know, I don't, I don't remember. I'm looking at the nominees for that year and I don't remember life is beautiful, but Elizabeth and the thin red line and saving private Ryan were all better than Shakespeare in love. Yeah. Like every single, yeah. and I'm sure Life is Beautiful was too, because Shakespeare in Love was just trash. But, you know, I mean, any one of those three, like I still would have been, I still would have been disappointed if Elizabeth or Thin Ren Line won over Saving Private Ryan, but not nearly as much. I could be like, all right, yeah, they're good movies. They're deserving. It wasn't the movie I would have picked, but I wouldn't have been angry about it. Like if I heard well, Shakespeare in Love. I was like, the fuck? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the fact that <clears throat> one for it is beautiful. I'm like, no, that didn't deserve it either. Well, look, life is life is beautiful. It's an incredible film. I mean, it's a it's a real terror jerker. Yeah. If you don't remember what that film is, it's Robert Bernini's film where, you know, he is sent to a concentration camp and he basically makes up a story for his kid that he's trying to hide that it's all a game. You know, so that I didn't. I didn't get to see a lot of those movies because remember the '99 Oscars. Those pictures were released in 1998. In 1998, I was in the middle of the Indian Ocean on a tiny little island called Diego Garcia. So, yeah. like, my I have a pop culture gap of 12 months in my life because the internet wasn't then what it is today. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I like, I saw those movies after the fact. I didn't see those movies until I got back home to the states. So. Right. Well, but, and, uh, but anything, <clears throat> anything from that year that was nominated for Best Picture was clearly better than Shakespeare in Love. And it's to me, it's still the worst tra travesty of the Oscars and why they shouldn't really be taken seriously anymore. I mean, so it's and just, great if you get an Oscar. I'm not saying that there aren't people that aren't deserving of it. Um, but at the same time, if you're going to be able to do that kind of a campaign, Pain to get an Oscar over our superior films, then what's the <clears throat> what's the fucking point of having an award yeah, show? Right. And I mean, you know, and let's also just look at the quality of films that that are being put forth for Oscars over the last couple of years compared to like I originally put in 1998 by accident. Listen to the five movies that were nominated for Best Picture in 1998. 
Titanic, Goodwill Hunting, as good as it gets, the full Monty, and LA Confidential. Yeah. All of them. All of them. All of them classics. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not yeah. a huge Titanic fan or James Cameron fan, but I recognize that it was a groundbreaking cinematic thing. And sure. the full Monty was one of the best comedies I've ever seen. Goodwill Hunting is an amazing story, as good as it gets. I mean, that's probably Jack Nicholson's Nicholson's best acting, and L.A. Confidential is probably the best film noir movie of the last sixty years. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, and, no- and nobody and nobody doubts how great Goodwill Hunting is, and you know, superior writing and what Ben Affleck and Matt Damon did, especially the performance of Robin Williams and still on Scar Scarsgard. But, and I think I think that was the right choice that year. But like, I would have been happy with any of those five winning. Yeah, right. Like, they were all deserving. Like literally, also, you know, every everybody who wins gets up to there and goes, "Oh, all the nominees were so deserving." That's not always true. In this case, it was actually true. It was. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry, but Boogie Nights is a way better movie than Titanic. But you can't have a a movie about the porn industry <laughs> winning best Oscar. Yeah, yeah they're, they're never going to put that in there. Even with even now that you can nominate like ten of them, they would never put that in there. Right. Well, you know, and here's the thing. I don't know. The Oscars go through this thing where, you know, we've got to have the politically correct movie. We've got to have it. It's got to tick all the categories to make it look like that, you know, we're, you know, we're not divisive, that, uh, you know, we're inclusive and blah, blah, blah. I'll take Moonlight as a shining example. I'm not knocking Moonlight as a movie that won a couple of years. Obviously, it's more deserving than La La Land. Because La La Land is shouldn't even been nominated. I mean, that's just an homage to classic musicals of the 1950s with Pretty Boy Ryan Gosling. But whatever. Um, but gay, but like the, the, here's what Moonlight had in the movie: gay black teen coming of age story. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, you 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 hit all those boxes of like, well, yeah, that's pretty much going to win. But you also had films like. Lion, uh, an incredible movie. Yeah, and I am not ashamed to say that I cry at the end of that film. I really do. Yeah. So you you had that one, which I thought really should have won. Hidden figures. But I'm like, yeah, hidden figures was awesome. Yeah, but the Oscars are probably like, yeah, but India got its Oscar years before. You know, once in a generation. Yeah, we've already given it to them. Um. The, the other issue that I kind of take, if you want to be more conservative choices or what you think, is touching on political issues. Uh, let's take Crash from 2005. Does anybody really believe Crash deserved Best Picture? I mean, it was Hell an interesting. Hell no. Hell yeah. no. You know, but you know the film that was really the best film of that year from acting performances to everything? Brokeback Mountain. Yeah, but we can't have a story about two gay cowboys falling in love to be our best picture. And I'm like, and I want to say that if that film was made today, it would probably check all those boxes and they would instantly give it almost like, look, look how much we love homos- the, the homosexual community now. We're appreciative of it and more accepting of it compared to, you know, 16 years ago. And I'm just like, or, or do you think that there's not gay cowboys out there? I guarantee you there are plenty of gay cowboys who love each other and are probably more manly than you are. <laughs> <laughs> so basically it was just fear and paranoia that kept that thing from winning Best Picture. Yeah. 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 But, you know, you know, they finally gave uh, Ang Lee a, a, an Oscar for Best Director for The Life of Pi. <laughs> not even that good of a film. Um, an interesting it, was, film. it was good, but yeah, it visually was, stunning. Visually, it was stunning, yeah. But other than that, <clears> like, eh. right? But. So again, I just think there's this reoccurring theme of we don't really appreciate what the great film, what truly the great films are, or they're just Oscar bait, and we can't we can't have a big budget movie really win because it's not artsy enough. Okay, perfect example. I've got your. Perfect example. Go ahead. 1978. Annie Hall wins Best Picture oh over Star my Wars. God. Oh my God. Why yeah. I hate Woody Allen. 
Well, one of the reasons why I hate Woody Allen. I, I have many reasons why I can't stand. I was Woody actually Allen, but... gonna. I was gonna save that for the end of the podcast because that was gonna Sorry. be my. But no, 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 no. no. <clears throat> but this goes to my thing about big budget movies. First of all, let's talk about Annie Hall as not really a good movie, but it's considered groundbreaking because he's a comedian that breaks the fourth wall. Well, guess what? Gary Shandling did it better. So fuck you. So does Deadpool. So does Deadpool. I was about to say. <laughs> so does Deadpool. And Deadpool, hey, I'll put it this way. Deadpool does it in print, in comics, mm-hmm. better than Woody Allen did it in film. Right. Because nobody not believed that shit thing. anyway. Woody Allen couldn't get that kind of tale if it, if it got left to him in their will. I'm sorry. You're just right. actually you're just a well, slub. Actually, hell, I'll put it this way. Christian Slater did it better in cuffs, okay? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yes. <laughs> Telling you out. First of all, in nowhere in a logical universe is someone like Diane Keep gonna fall in love with Woody Allen. That's not no. even a believable story. Come on. No, it's not plausible at all. It, there's only I, like look, one Woody Beauty Allen. Beauty and the Beast I, with the guy being magically transferred into a beast and then coming back is still a more believable love story, okay? <laughs> no shit. Hell, this is it's the first time this will ever be said. Story. Twilight's a better love story. <laughs> right. <laughs> this week's on the first, apocalypse. Brendan first said. and last, first and last time that sentence will ever escape my mouth. <laughs> okay. But we are recording this, so <laughs> Yeah, but that's in record. I'll never actually say it again. Right, right, it's right. Visible as evidence in your trial. In 10 years, we're going to be drinking like, I never said that. I'm going to pull up that clip. No shit, Brendan. There. <laughs> no, when it comes, but you say, if you put it in context and say, you said that in regards to Woody Allen, I'll be like, oh, yeah, I said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said that shit. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like we should make a highlight reel. Woody Allen really does suck and just put this as part of the highlight reel. But anyway, you I'm think down. about it. The films from 1978 that you know was really up for best picture uh you know julia a great little holocaust film which jason robards won well jason robards and vanessa redgrave both won oscars from that film close encounters of the third guy another great steven spielberg movie and then the coup de gras for all of us nerds star wars mm. tell me how you fucking think annie hall is a better story and better movie than Star Wars. Okay. And we just, but we can't have science fiction movies that, you know, when not artsy enough. Yeah. They're not, they're, they're, they're not, they're not true art. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. And that's, I don't think there's actually ever been a science fiction uh, movie that's ever won Best Picture. Did I Avatar? Can... No. Does that really, no. no I think it's Locker beat it. Which husband, one? Oh, ex-husband versus ex-wife. Remember that shit? Oh, hurt lock. Well, yeah. yeah, and then and then hurt locker. I'm sorry, hurt from a military standpoint. For, I hate that movie. <laughs> I do too. I think it's horse shit. Yeah, you know, yeah, the EOD rep's gonna go run. The EOD guy's gonna go running off the fob by himself into a war zone. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Insert John Candy voice. Uh, yeah, but yeah, okay. So we'll, we can move on past that, but um. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so I don't know. It has I? I mean, we've had a fantasy movie win because Lord of the Rings: Return of the King won, but I don't know right. about a science fiction movie. Did like no. two thousand one: A Space Odyssey win, or did Gravity win? No. That I don't. That one I don't know. I don't think Gravity did win. Um, it was nominated for a crap ton, but I thought maybe either that or just the director won. It might have just been uh, the director. Um, I, there, there yeah. have been. Uh, it won the BAFTA for been, the best film, but not the the. Uh, not the Oscar. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It won like editing, sound editing, sound mixing, uh, cinematography, best director, and best original score. Um, yeah. Right. So that. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, you've had plenty. I mean, like The Martian. With Matt Damon was nominated, you know, didn't win. I mean, you've had Arrival, um, which was another one that, and actually, I wanted that one to win. But what about we that? Just can't... What about that Matthew McConaughey one that came out a couple of years ago? Interstellar. Yeah. Interstellar. No. No. So yeah. So I guess I don't think we have. No. So... And I think that's one of the things about 
you know, the Oscars, like, we just can't have a I know great Battlefield Sunday. Earth didn't win. <laughs> we don't talk about that here. <laughs> Sorry. But but if but if you look There's, on the Scientology website, it probably claims it did. <laughs> it has a, it has spread Scientology even more than Tom Cruise has. <laughs> but no. I, when you really look at that year, um uh, I mean I either Star Wars or Close Encounters of the Third Kind would have easily been perfect winners but i think star wars is obviously the better movie because it, it is the same mythological tales that we do tell just in a different format i mean he hits all the right notes um and, with it, myth. and it's an homage to great filmmakers of the past like kurosawa and kurosawa, the old spaghetti yeah. westerns so yeah right. i mean it's there's i mean it, there's a lot of respect for hollywood history in that movie and it's a new and interesting way to tell mythological stories. And it was completely groundbreaking on a technical level. So it changed how we made movies. It changed how we look at movies. It changed. It created the summer blockbuster, really. I mean, yeah, you could argue maybe Jaws did. But, you know, I mean, not like Star Wars did. I mean, I, yeah. you know, Jaws maybe lit the spark and then Star Wars set it on fire and summer movies became a thing. Yeah, with marketing um, so and merchandising alone, it, it yeah, game changing. It, it literally changed the entire industry. That one movie. Yeah, Annie Hall didn't change anything in comedy or how we look at it. There had already been dark comedy before that. There's been plenty of great dark comedy that's been better after. I, the funniest, I'm the funniest joke in Annie Hall is the fact that Woody Har well, Woody Woody Harrels Woody uh, Allen wrote himself a script where he gets the hot girl. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much it right, right there oh okay um, well, yeah there's your sci-fi best picture winner <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> <Just> saying <laughs> Woo! overstating I the guess. obvious oh, wow. actually no no i'm gonna have to disagree with you chad there because that's not a work of science fiction that's pure fantasy it's just pure fantasy <laughs> <laughs> No, it's pure horseshit, and I don't think that's a category. Well, it's the Oscars, so... Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. I digress. Mm. Right. Uh, so, wow, now, that I've, now, that I've, now that I've now that I've stolen your thunder on Star Wars, uh, Marcus, where, where are we going no, next? No, 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 that's perfectly fine. I Because to me, uh, that is, is really, really worth Travis... Travis, other than Saving Private Ryan not winning in the Oscar because they just can't recognize a groundbreaking film like that that actually has a fantastic story and the same kind of story that we have told, you know, in great adventure stories, other myth mythological tales uh, that are recognized as, you know, the best films of all time. Oh, and, let me... I just I was not aware of this story. Let me let me chime in real quick, Marcus, sure. because it, it it speaks to what we don't like about the Oscars and how long it's really been going on. In 1971, George C. Scott declined his Best Actor award for Patton, going so far as to warn the Academy, "Don't even nominate me because I'm not going to show up. I'm not going to accept it, and I don't like how you guys do this whole." He didn't like the entire awards process. He thought it was a sham. And so he didn't even accept the award. Yeah. You so, know, I mean, that's just, Brando that was, and too. that was, and that was 50 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Brando did too for Godfather. Yeah. So I, 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 I fully, it, okay. Let me refer, let me put it to you this way. As a press outlet that, you know, we obviously film and, and gaming are, you know, our two main things. And, we, we love this medium but as a press outlet that covers a lot of different film festivals and we are proud to cover film festivals because we get to see a lot of films that are never really going to make money they may not go anywhere they may not get the kind of distribution but they are done by people who struggle and raise money and do it without really getting paid to put together a project OK, uh, to tell a story that in a lot of ways is much better than 
Hollywood blockbuster that have a two hundred million dollar budget. Yeah. You know, the passion so for their art is tangible; it's palpable. You right. can feel it. There, you can see right. it. That also not only hit our nostalgia, but also talk about difficult subjects that people don't want to talk about. The fact that we get to interview those kind of filmmakers, that we see these films, but there are awards. In doing the film festival circuit, you can pick up many, many awards that are for audience-based awards anyway, that are voted on by audience, by the audience. Those, are, I think, are better awards than the Oscars. Mm -hmm. They may not, they may not get the fanfare, the award shows, the after parties, blah 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 blah. They may not. To me, the Oscars are really just kind of a marketing tool. It's great to say, well, this person won an Oscar, and obviously, you know, he's going to do great stuff all the time. Uh, good example. Uh, Nicholas Cage has an Oscar. Has he done great films all the time? Oh, I will no, say this. No. I will say this. Nicolas Cage is one of those rare actors where his movie, you almost have to go see his movies because his performance is either going to be Oscar worthy or it's going to be so bad. It's going to spawn memes for days. It's going to be golden raspberry. Yes. Really. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's going to be one or the other. Dude's going to be like, oh, that's the best thing I've seen all year. Or that's the worst thing I've seen in a decade. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jamie Foxx won an Oscar obviously well deserving of playing Ray Charles okay? right movie and, and spot on and the fact that he learned how to play piano like blind and, and all that okay I get that but Jamie Foxx also hasn't done great work and everything he does since then it doesn't make you yeah, automatically he, 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 he was electro. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> he he so, was I mean, he was he was powder with a black light on him. Right. Wow. That's what that's what his costume was was powder yeah, with a black was. light. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So, like I said, I I, I just I, I feel like film festival awards and those kind of audience awards are more deserving because it is the audience who decides whether you have, whether it's great. I mean, not even critics. I'm not trying to take away from what we do as critics. But we also review stuff from a fan standpoint. You know, is this a movie we would watch again? Is this worth renting? Or is this something that, eh, it's not a great movie, but it's a fun movie and we'll watch it again and we recognize it for what it is. Um, I'll give you a shiny example. I, I mentioned Raging Bull and Rocky earlier. One of the best press screenings that Brendan and I ever did is we saw that Robert Duvall, or not, Robert De Niro and Sylvester Stallone movie Grudge Match. We just went on a Tuesday night. They didn't even have a whole lot of press there. Uh, we grabbed a beer at the theater and we couldn't stop laughing through the entire movie. And then we went back to the pub and drank more beer and kept quoting lines from that movie telling people about this movie. And I mean, we walked out and I think Josh with Ally was like, well, you two sounded like you actually enjoyed the movie. We could hear you guys laughing. <laughs> oh, Kevin Hart was hilarious in that movie. Yeah. Like, oh, I, that, I think no, that's I, the movie that really introduced me to to Kevin Hart too. I don't, I don't think I really knew who he was before yeah, that. But my point is, that's not an Oscar movie. It's not going to win any awards. It's just a fun movie to watch about two guy, two iconic actors who have played two iconic boxing roles coming together to make a fun boxing movie. It, it, it was, it was a fictionalized version that happened eight years, seven years before it actually happened with Roy Jones and Mike Dyson. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, which, by the way, it did also foreshadow because uh, the end of that movie is Kevin Hart trying to get, you know, Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield to fight again. And Vander's yeah. just like, no. And Mike Tyson, who I really do enjoy as an actor now, he really does have some great comedic timing. Just him. Come on, let's do it, man. Let's do. It. But now they are actually fighting <laughs> next month, and you're like, I don't know if it's going to be a train wreck of a fight, but by God, we're going to watch it. It'll be a train wreck. It'll be a train wreck, yeah. and it'll be a anyway, fantastic train wreck. Mm -hmm. I can't wait. I, I hey, really hope we get another more. Great I, example. Uh, 
the sequel to um, uh, Train Spotting, Train Spotting Two. The yeah. sequel's not as good as the original. I mean, the original definitely worthy of awards. Things that dealt with, but Brendan and I again, we went and saw that movie, had a great time, and then went and got drunk at the pub afterwards and couldn't stop quoting that movie. And I think that there are films that should be recognized that they're just fun movies to watch. They don't need an Oscar. And they're still way fucking better than Annie Hall. <laughs> mm-hmm. It may not be Godfather 2, but it's also not Highlander 2. So it's that nice. <laughs> I don't know. I might actually want to watch Highlander 2 before I watch Annie Hall. No, 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 no. no. Believe me, I would too. Hold my feet uh, to the fire. I'll watch the quick. I have a funny We can bash Annie Hall all day on this show, but I actually had kind of a funny story uh, about a woman that I saw for a little while who we were talking about movies and she was really into Annie Hall and I hated Woody Allen. And she just, you know, it was like, you're, you're not as cool as I think you are. I'm like, well, but if you are into dark comedy, that's very true about like relationships. And I have one better for you. She's like, oh, what is it? It's called Gross Point Blank. It's about <laughs> a hitman coming back to his high school reunion and, you know, getting back with the girl that he showed up at prom before he went off and became an assassin. And the underlying should have brought level. my gun. Should yeah. be fun. <laughs> and anyway, I made her watch it. She's like, "Well, I still think Annie Hall's better, but I did like this movie." Like, okay, well, fair enough. Progress. You're wrong, but that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. That Just you're... so you know that I wasn't wrong in pointing out that this is a great dark comedy, and that and that was my point. If but, you want and... a truly dark comedy, go watch Very Bad Things. Oh my God! Yes. <laughs> That movie is three shades past midnight. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed my ass off. <laughs> Very underrated movie. I mean, if you want... when he goes, uh, when he goes to get the ring off Christian Slater, and Christian Slater's not dead, and he moves, he grabs the ring, and he yells in the middle of the church so everybody can hear it. He's Christ. <laughs> it just echoes through the church and everybody's like <laughs> <laughs> right no and and i i agree all right um i've mentioned a few and stuff like that um chad do you have another really big kind of oscar controversy that we haven't talked about that oh yeah oh yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. oh i feel He's like he's been chad... waiting for this Chad's yeah, been yeah. waiting up. Like a group to... therapy moment with Chad to finally unload. Go ahead. This is probably going to piss some people off, raise some hackles, ruffle some feathers. I personally could not give two shits. Um, <laughs> but um, I Those... never thought, I never thought Forrest Gump should have won for best picture that year. Thank you. Okay. All right. When you are nominated in a year where both Pulp Fiction and Shawshank exists, yeah. even Quiz Show, I think, would have been a better Best Picture fit than, than Forrest Gump. I like, don't get me wrong, I like Forrest Gump quite it's a bit. It's a good movie. Uh, it, and it's a better book. I read the book when I was in the Navy, when I was in the Persian Gulf, and I was like, this would make a hysterical movie. But then when the right. movie came out, it was so damn serious. you know. And, and I'm just like, Wow, they, they kind of took a lot of the funnier parts out because he was a lot dumber in the book. I don't know if any of you guys have read the book. Um, but he was, yeah, he was he was Jethro Bodine in that book. He was dumber than they portray him in the film. He was schlep rock, knuckle drag in the ground, dumb. But um, uh, after seeing films just as utterly life-changing as, as Pulp Fiction and especially Shawshank, I don't know about you guys, but if I'm flipping channels and if there's only 10 minutes left of Shawshank, I'm locked in every time. I'm, I'm shot. I was, I, I, I'm not surprised that Pulp Fiction didn't win just because of the ultraviolet nature and, and Quentin True. Tarantino's reputation. And I was shocked Shawshank didn't win. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I, I mean, it's, like, it's almost I, like the opposite side of the corner of what we were talking about earlier about the big budget films kind of getting ignored. And yeah. the artsy films always win, but this is a case where I think the opposite was true, that yeah. there was so much push behind Gump, and it became such a phenomenon. Is, There's no way this thing can't win because they'll be riding in the streets if Tom Hanks doesn't get his Oscar. And I was going to say, was it so much about Forrest Gump, or was it about Tom Hanks? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think both things fed into that machine. And I think yeah. that's why Gump walked away with the win. But well, yeah, I, and, I was just I, I thought, floored. Yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that Tom Hanks didn't deserve best picture or whatever. Fine, give it to him. Okay. But the film itself, you're right, up against some really incredible films of 1994. And you know what? We have this recurring theme about 1994 being, you know, one of the best one of the best years in film history. I mean, we compare it to like 1939, which had so many great classics and any one of the films nominated for Best Picture could have easily won in any other year. But yeah, I, Pulp Fiction was the most talked about movie that year because it was so groundbreaking. I, I, there's a great interview with Clint Eastwood where he talks about, you know, being a juror at, at Cannes where that's all that that was the film everybody talked about. You know, they just everybody had to see it because it was so different. The characters, you know, while over the top, seemed so real, okay, and the philosophical speeches on top of the uber violence seemed to mesh perfectly, okay. But you're right. I mean, Quentin Tarantino rubbing people the wrong way and just not being very likable it, but it also proves that the Oscars are a popularity contest. I mean, you're, well, you're yeah. basically voting for, you know, prom and, king and queen. And they're just, they're just loath to give anything to, you know, something that's that violent. Um, you know, yeah. and I don't mean, I mean, and I'm not talking about war movies. I know war movies have won awards, but I mean, that's just, you know, gratuitous personal violence, you know, one-on-one. Uh, right and and just you know the amount the way he uses blood and the way he uses violence they're just they're just loath to make those movies and elevate them to best picture so that's why as as much as i enjoyed pulp fiction it's to me that and reservoir dogs are his two best movies and everything's kind of gone downhill from there but um i just haven't liked his newer stuff but uh you know, I just wasn't surprised that it didn't win. Like I'd have a lot of friends that were honestly shocked that it didn't win. And I'm like, really? You're shocked? Like I was right. kind of surprised it even got nominated just because of the way the, the Academy is. But um, yeah. I, to me, the one that shocked me was, was Shawshank. Like quiz show that one. I mean, it was a good movie, but I, I didn't really think it had a chance at winning four weddings and a funeral I had no chance at winning. Uh, well, I look at 1994 as this. Pulp Fiction is easily my choice for best picture, easily. But if you're not going to do it, then the best film really of that year is Shawshank Redemption. By a long time. So it, it's, it's just another case of, well, we got to have a happy film and be good and, and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's just bullshit. I think there, you know, there somebody should make a great documentary about re-examining the, the Oscars, like who should have won, like re, like we got it wrong. I, I'll, I'll treat it to, I, I liken it to like the O.J. Simpson trial, where 25 year, years later, after they came out with that four-part documentary re-examining everything and, and how it affected society, even the jurors now are like, yeah, we know he did it. <laughs> Jesus. Can, we, can we change our vote now? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I've got one more myself before we close it out. But Brendan, I want to give you the opportunity for one more that you think is the ultimate travesty with the Oscar. Um, yeah. Well, for me, the one that pissed me off the most, and then they kind of gave him the the mea culpa, was uh, when Fellowship of the Ring lost to a movie that literally no one had ever heard of. Yeah, I don't even remember the name of it. Um, and then of course they came back two movies later and, and gave it to Peter Jackson for Return of the King, which in that year, Return of the King, while an excellent film, was probably not the best picture. Um, and it was really was just kind of almost like a hey, okay, here's an achievement award for the last three years. Add a boy, Peter, add a boy. But uh, you know, but right. he really should like the Fellowship of the Ring that year was legitimately the best movie to come out all year. And I I can't tell you. Like to this day, without looking it up, I couldn't tell you the one guy who won the the picture that won. I, that I, was the 2002 Oscar, right? So let's look. I uh, think so. Um, I, I uh, that 
best picture. Oh, a beautiful mind. It was the Ron Howard film with Russell Crowe. That's no, it didn't win. Uh, uh, like I think in the bedroom one. No, 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 no. That's I'm looking up right now. Um, the winner was a beautiful mind. I could have sworn they lost a, something I'd never heard of, but okay. All well, right. I mean, but I do agree with you. I mean, a beautiful mind while an engaging film and, you know, but took a lot of, you know, liberties about John Nash, the mathematician. You're right. Fellowship of the ring. And of course, you know, it went up again, but look at the, okay. Look at the films that went up against a beautiful mind, but whatever. Gosford Park. I love Robert Altman, and it is an okay film. In the Bedroom, nobody really cares or even Moulin heard about Rouge. it. And then Moulin Rouge, which, by the way, is just basically a crappy musical based off the of Puccini opera, but whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, Training Day, Denzel Washington won his Oscar, his second Oscar for Training Day, but yet that film doesn't even get nominated. So, and that was a whole other thing. You you look yeah. at look at the people. Uh, Halle Berry won for Monsters Ball, so you've got the first year the two African American actors, you know, win the two most coveted awards for actors, but their films aren't good enough to even get nominated for best. Yeah, she was also nominated for the Golden Turkeys and Golden Raspberries for the in the same year for Catwoman. So there's that. <laughs> Yeah, that was uh, that was that movie killed Benjamin Bratt's career. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Benjamin Bratt killed Benjamin Bratt's career. So Benjamin Bratt's agent killed his career. Well, I'm going to give you two instances where, again, the Oscars. It, it's one of those things where they have to rectify a mistake, where they have to show that you know they're they're inclusive and more accepting of other directors or actors. So I want to I want to talk about. Actor awards. Can we all we all pretty much agree that Daniel Day Lewis, that anytime he does a performance, it's it's an Oscar worthy performance, right? Because right. he's uh-huh. yeah, he's he's probably at least getting nominated. Right, I agree absolutely. Uh, the last uh, what was the last one? Did he win for? I know he's he's won four, right? My left foot, there will be blood, and then Lincoln. Was that the one? Or was it the? I don't remember Frank? exactly which ones he's won, but uh, yeah. Let me. For, uh, was he up for in the name of the Father or whatever? Well, he was nominated. I mean, again, he's pretty much uh, okay. This is all you need to know about Daniel Day Lewis and how much he's been awarded. When you look up his page on Wikipedia, it doesn't list his awards. It has a link to another article for all of his awards and nominations. <laughs> right. Because right. Because <laughs> it can't fit into them. he's Meryl Streep. He has right. 212 okay. nominations and 139 wins from oh, different. Right. So let's see. Yeah. He was uh he won for my left foot. He was nominated for In the Name of the Father. He lost to Tom Hanks in Philadelphia. He was nominated for Gangs of New York. He lost to Adrian Brody in the pianist. Uh he was nominated for There Will Be Blood and One, Lincoln and One, and then in 2018 phantom thread he was nominated and he lost to probably my favorite best actor nomination or winner ever is gary oldman because they right. finally gave gary oldman an oscar and that's another thing is they finally gave him one for it's like uh, who do i got to play to finally win an oscar well uh, i'm fine i'll do churchill yeah, and he and he me. he won all those same ones, including Gangs of New York on the BAFTAs, which are you know the British Oscars, right? So, right. so yeah, well, so he has point. he has it, seven it, it, BAFTAs and Oscars. That's stupid. Right. <laughs> well, again, and this is what I bring up: his last best actor was for Lincoln. While a great film, and he does an incredible job as Lincoln. Okay, no one's denying that. Is that the one he really should have won for? No. I still think whether you like Scorsese or not, or even like Gangs of New York, how do you not win the Oscar for playing Bill the Butcher? Seriously. Yeah, that, he, won it, he won it for BAFTA. He did not win the Golden Globe for that. Uh, I remember having I remember Jack having a Nicholson won for that. When, yeah. Henry Tom, when Henry Thomas was here at the festival and he was just kind of hanging out at the pub, 
we were talking about films in his career. I remember talking to him about that. And, you know, he and he confirms, like, Daniel Day-Lewis does not break character. I mean, it was downright scary, you know, working with him and, and his, the persona that he had. And I, even he's like, how do you not you, win the Oscar for that? I'll tell you why he didn't. I, I'll, I'll tell you exactly why he didn't. You want to know why? Because he won the BAFTA for it. He was nominated for the Golden Globe and he won the SAG Award for it. So the only thing he didn't wore and he like he won the Critics Choice Award for Gangs of New York. He uh, yeah. So like because of all that, he won everything else. The, the, the Academy, you'll see this, too. If somebody wins, if somebody wins the Golden Globe, if somebody wins a BAFTA, if somebody wins the, the SAG Award, the Oscar comes out and it's somebody different. The, the the Oscars will go a different direction just to go in a different direction. Just to go in a different direction, yeah. right? Yep. And like and, it's and, it's shockingly rare for somebody to sweep the BAFTA, the Golden Globe, the SAG, and and the uh, well, Oscars. I don't I'm know if it's saying, ever happened I'm, in Best I'm, Actor or Best not, Actress. I don't want to take away anything from Adrian Brody's performance in The Pianist. It's it, it is a good movie, and he did an incredible job. And whatever, it's also a Holocaust movie, and you know we have to keep coming back around every so often and, and revisit it, it's like every 10 years you realize that movie came out 10 years after schindler's list so it's like yeah. it's about time we revisit this and you know and there's not any of us that denies that schindler's list wasn't very deserving of the oscar i mean it's an incredible film but you're also not going to watch it over and over i i haven't seen that movie in 20 years and i can't bring myself to it's just just ugh. anyway all right. Yeah, I, so I, I said the same thing about Pearl Harbor, but for very different reasons. <laughs> well, yeah. no, no. When we do, you know, if we we could do a 20th anniversary, uh, you know, thing about Pearl Harbor, but it will be a drinking contest at Grafton Growler with Brandon's and, new beer. And we will be doing it a Mystery Science Theater 3000 style. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Like, hey, Here he is- just drove to Fort Island. There wasn't a bridge there until 1996. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait, wait, holiday. <laughs> anyway, you, you're, you know, my favorite story about you in that movie is uh, the vets that you guys were escorting who didn't want to see the screening and they just wanted to go drink with you guys. <laughs> yeah. Like, you got like, a- like halfway through the movie, they got up and left the because the, the premiere was on the deck of the John C. Stennis in Pearl Harbor. And we were a bunch of us were escorting some older vets that they had brought out. And yeah, about halfway through the movie, when they completely screwed up the order of events in Pearl Harbor, which these guys all know by heart, <laughs> you know, yeah. they, they were like, uh, can we go home? This sucks. <laughs> they were like, can we go to the bar? So you, right. <laughs> somebody give me so, Michael Bay's phone number so I could go by his house and kick him in the nuts. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> It's like, well, uh, he's in the French, bro. If you want to Rochambeau him and then run down the gangplank, I'll block. All right. So here's my little take about the Oscars and race relations. Because, you know, we always got to come back around and deal with these politically charged movies. And this has to do with 2019. So that was the year that Green Book won for Best Picture versus Black Klansman. They just can't give you know, Spike Lee, the, the best picture for one of his films. They're just never going to do it. Okay. Um, Which is irony because Black Klansman, he probably deserved it that time. Yeah. That movie was well, hilarious. Well, no, he deserved it. He deserved it for Do the Right Thing. The Right Thing, yeah. I don't know if I've ever seen that, so I'll I'll, I'll, I'll take your guys' as word. Uh, who, I got to remember who uh, won the Oscars. There was a film that year uh, that did win uh, that I think was another way of them sugarcoating like race relations or whatever. Uh, Who won? Oh, yeah. Driving Miss Daisy. That was the one because that's the film (laughs) dealing with race that we should, you know, let, let win best picture. Nothing against the performances, but, you know, it's a friendship between a black driver and a older white lady and blah, 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 versus actual racial tensions <laughs> in New York. Okay. But getting I'm, past it. I'm, 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 I'm a little 
uh, confession here. I have never actually seen Driving Miss Daisy. I have only seen clips. I I saw it once with my grandparents when it first came out, and I've never watched it again and have no desire to. Yeah, I'm like I, I like Morgan Freeman a lot, but I'd right, you know, I'd, so, I'd probably rather listen to him narrate a nature show than watch Driving Miss Daisy. Right. So let's take a step back to 2019, nearly 30 years later, when Spike Lee is up again for you know Best Picture with one of his films. First of all, Black Klansman is an incredible film that deals with all sides of racial tensions. Uh, it's funny that a black man got to infiltrate <laughs> the Ku Klux Klan based on a true story and that you are also dealing with a black man that doesn't hate cops. He is a cop and respects it, but wants to get rid of bad cops. Mm -hmm. Something that plays well in today's society indeed it does okay. it right versus a movie where a white guy drives a black guy around the south and has to save him constantly so you have a film that perpetuates the myth that a black guy needs a white savior good job yeah yeah <laughs> and dr shirley's uh family hates that movie because it's completely inaccurate <laughs> so i mean Again, good job on dealing with uh, a, a, a whitewashing racial, you know, racial tensions within your stories. One that's completely inaccurate versus one that's based off a true story and deals with more accurate subject matter. So I think the Oscars just, they don't like Spike Lee and they're just never going to give it to him. It's almost like, well, we've given you a participation award with you know best screenplay and best nominations and yeah yeah well, whatever so you're again i think it's just a popularity contest more than anything else and i ask and i i, I want to ask who why should we care about the oscar why is this the end all of end all you know it's it's watch? worse than a popularity contest though it, it is and because Critics, you know, the the People's Choice Awards, that's a popularity contest, too. It's not a popularity contest. It's who can kiss the Academy's ass the best. Mm -hmm. It's who's going to bend the knee and spread the cheeks and get in there and give them the best kiss. Yeah. yeah. It was obviously not Spielberg for years. I mean, when you go and up against Chariots and of Fire look, and lose and go up against... Uh, out of Africa and lose. I'm just like, mm. yeah. And and look, like I and and I'm not the biggest Spike Lee fan, but I do respect him, and I guarantee you, he ain't bending the knee. No, <laughs> no. Mm -mm. Right. He'll extend uh, a finger. <laughs> <laughs> He'll Me extend too. Actually. And you know what? Bring up another great topic. I forgot about at, out of Africa winning over the color purple. The yeah. fucking look. color purple. How yeah. is that not automatically? That's yeah. well, again, how does Chariots of Fire beat Raiders of the Lost Ark? Explain that shit to me. Well, I dare you to try. Dry yeah. ass, boring. Na, 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 na. <laughs> <laughs> does anybody remember? I don't remember the character's name. I don't remember what year the story takes place. I know it's about running, but we know the song. That's the one thing you know from Chariots of Fire. Is this the only thing worth remembering? Yeah. <laughs> so I I want to say this. And again, it goes into a featured article that we're writing and we'll touch on you know more subjects more than anything else. Why do we need the Oscars? Why do we care? If 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 an Oscar for an actor gets you more work, if you're a struggling actor and you are able to get more work, as a shining example, um Why am I drawing a blank on her name? Uh, uh, million Dollar Baby. Hillary Swank. Okay. Hillary Swank, thank you. Welcome. Um, who won one of her very first films, hadn't been around, but she got, you know, Best Supporting Actress for uh, Boys Don't Cry. Don't Cry, yeah. Absolutely deserved it, okay? I think she only made like $25,000 
on that film anyway. Okay, it it got her other work. It, it it she became a working actress to where she could do you know bigger and better roles and all that, and led to Million Dollar Baby, which again very deserving. It's a great film. But other than that, why should we give a shit? I mean, we're going to cover it. We're going to tell you who wins and all that. But we feel like we should just take the time now and complain. I mean, like, you're probably not going to get it right this year like you don't most years. So here, here, here's a little more like how much the the Academy's disrespected Spike Lee over the years. So he was nominated for Best Original Screenplay for Do the Right Thing, Best Documentary for Four Little Girls, didn't win either. Obviously, in 2019, he he was Best Picture and Best Director nominations and didn't win either. He was, however, given the Academy Honorary Award for his contributions to filmmaking in 2015. So they gave him a Lifetime Achievement Award, but haven't recognized any of his actual films. (laughs) And it gets better. Did they give this to him during the Academy Awards in 2015? No, 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 they didn't. It was presented to him at the Governor's Awards in a private ceremony by Denzel Washington, Samuel Jackson, and Wesley Snipes. Now, it was probably, you know, cool because he's worked with all three of those guys many times. Right. So it was probably cool for him to get it from them. But they didn't even give him it to him at the Oscars. Like, here's your little participation trophy. Thanks for showing up. But don't actually show up. Yeah. You know what that, you know what that the equivalent is? Well, we know you have the, uh, the money to get into Augusta Country Club and play the golf course. But you're really not allowed to. So yeah. if, you, if you do play, you'll have to do it in private. You yeah. know what that is? That's the Indianapolis Colts hanging up a AFC runner-up banner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there you go. I don't really care who wins this year. I mean, personally, the film that I want to win is The Trial of the Chicago 7. Um, I, I just want to see Aaron Sorkin get the award because I think he's a brilliant writer and I think the films that he has directed have turned out you know, really good. But I'm sure we'll give it to films who don't care and, or, or you know, no one's going to watch. I watched Nomadland. I'll never watch it again. <laughs> recognize, yeah. I, it is, I, mean, it, I recognize the performances, but I'm not going to go back and you know, watch that. Uh, you know how many times I've seen Chariots of Fire? Once. How many times I've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yeah. I'm out. I'm out of fingers and toes to count. I watch it every <laughs> year. I watch it every year. I've watched it every year since 1981. And, and probably more than once a year, too, because it inevitably shows up on TNT or TBS. And you're like stop, sitting yeah. there on a Saturday and you're like, I can either <laughs> watch a baseball game that's like the athletics in Mariners that I don't care about, or I can watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. Hey, you know Raiders. You know what's even more deserving of the Oscar than fucking Chariots of Fire? The guys as children who made a shot for shot re, you yes. know, <laughs> of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Raiders, the greatest documentary ever made, yeah. Those guys are more rewarded. It, they're, they're are more deserving. They're more deserving because when they did the whole fire scene in the bar, Almost burned no practical down. effect. We have a flame retarded jacket and some kerosene. That's how we did the shot. It almost killed and the guy and burned died. his house down. Yeah, if you've never seen the documentary about those guys and how uh, that, that that film came about, and then they finally raised the money to do the airplane shot as adults and got it for I'll tell you who deserves an Oscar more than Chariots of Fire or bringing it back, Woody Allen. Uh, the guys who reshot the Darth Vader and Obi Wan fight, the remastered scene thirty-eight. Yes. If you, by the way, if you're a nerd and you love Star Wars, which you probably are, if you're watching us, go on YouTube, look at re- the remastered scene thirty-eight, where they do an amazing. Like, if you could recut a New Hope and put this into a New Hope, it yeah. would be. It's, I mean, because it's you see you see a viscerally powerful Vader and Obi Wan still you know not quite out of his prime, but the just the choreography it's it's a mix of choreography between like the original yeah. trilogy choreography and the prequel trilogy, so it's not as fluid. It's a little bit more uh, you know just powerful striking, but you can see how where Obi Wan came from, and you can see the you know the the progression of younger old Obi-Wan to new, or newer or younger old that ah, God, my tongue, younger Obi-Wan to, to older Obi-Wan. It's fantastic. Just really go is. watch it. Do yourself a favor. If you haven't already. 
Yeah, and I agree. I mean, you got two incredibly good stunt doubles that were able to put this together. I'm like, I, I for the despecialized edition, you keep fixing shots. I'm like, just go ahead and throw it. Yeah. Because it's really... And, and, you, you see you the, know, the you sabers, you know, the sabers cutting the walls and leaving scorch marks on the wall. And uh, it's just, it's phenomenal. It also makes you get, it will make you get even more excited about the Obi-Wan Kenobi series that's coming out mm. next year. Yes, it yes. does. They are filming, filming right now. So. Yep, it is currently filming. So, all right. We're going to wrap this up. Uh, we'll be, we will not be back next week as we've got film festivals recovering, press junkets, and, uh, just a bunch of other things going on. So we'll be back in May uh, um, and we'll be, you know, talking about other nerdy things. Uh, but the Bad Batch comes is, out on May 4th. Do what? The Bad Batch comes out on May the 4th. Mm-hmm. On uh, oh, you know, doesn't. Okay. So we'll be back May 1st, but oh, we'll definitely be talking about the Bad Batch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can count on it. But anyway, this is kind of our take on the Oscars. It's kind of like, who gives a shit about it? And, There's the name of the show, Oscar. Oscar. Who gives a shit? In the, in the immortal yeah. words of Triumph, the insult comic dog, who gives a shit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for the filmmakers that we've interviewed over the years that, you know, have gone through the system to, you know, whether it's a short film that have gotten nominated or been recognized, we are proud of you. And if it leads to bigger budgets to be able to continue your projects that we want to see, then that's a good thing. Amen. But the rest of the popularity contest, whatever. I'm sorry. I'm just laughing because I just read something as I'm scrolling through. It says, stop slamming on your brakes when a, when a cop already has somebody pulled over. Unless you're holding a severed head out your window. He's too busy for you. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I just had to share that. <laughs> on that note. <laughs> and on that bombshell. All right. All right, everybody. We're gonna we are closing it out. Have a great nerdy week. And for you gamers out there, uh, I think on uh, I think they announced it that three days a day early on Xbox Game Pass, you'll be able to get MLB twenty one download it for free, which again is a real coup for Xbox and Game Pass. I can't wait to uh, play some baseball. And just to bring it back to the beginning, we got that from the Xbox website. Yeah. <laughs> just to point that out. Just to point that out. Well played, Brendan. Well played. <laughs> also, uh, don't inject your penis with hemorrhoid cream. <laughs> Important safety tip. Thank you, Egon. <laughs> it's and for, for you nerds out there, if you need a comparison, it's like crossing the streams. <laughs> it would be bad. Very bad. Be very bad. All right, everybody. Say goodbye.